Okay, so we learned about MPI this morning. Now we've just learned all about OpenMP from the OpenMP expert. Helen doesn't like to brag on herself, but Helen is an OpenMP expert. Helen wrote a book about OpenMP. Helen, can you? <laughs> Thank you. She wrote this book, co-authored this book with, with two other people. Yes. Tim Maxson is open and she kind of talk. He's the first author. Yeah, Tim Maxson, he's an awesome guy. Uh, Alice Congress, awesome lady too. And Helen wrote this book. So if you ever take a class on parallel programming in college and it, it uses OpenMP, you may study this book. And also, this book is so popular and so amazingly cool that it got translated into Chinese. So it's also widely used in China, it's my understanding. And it's an amazing book. And this is not my copy, this is Helen's copy. But Helen gave me an autographed copy. So that was super nice for her. Anyway, I just wanted to brag on her for a little bit and explain to you that you all just got taught by one of the preeminent experts on the OpenMP Common Core, which is what we covered today. Okay? Not to brag too much on her. Helen's turning red, but... <laughs> my job almost nobel prize for you almost nobel prize <laughs> worthy correct <laughs> correct okay so then you're going to go back to a regular mortal here who's going to tell you about a hybrid parallel programming so we learned about mpi this morning from me and from charles we learned about open mp from the expert herself and now we're going to learn about combining them both because like why not right sounds like a great thing so that's what we call hybrid programming. Okay, so we're gonna talk about like why we might wanna do this. We're gonna talk about things we wanna think about when we're doing it. Um, we're gonna talk about MPI threading support and kind of our uh, some ideas about designing hybrid algorithms and then I'll give you an example. Okay, so the first thing is multi-core architectures are here to stay. So you know, okay, back when I was your age, you know, um, each node had one processor on it, one core. And then um, with Moore's law, they said there's there's this, it's really an observation that um, the processing power of, of, of chips that are being manufactured uh, doubles about every 18 months. So, in maybe 20 years ago, they maybe 20, 25 years ago, they, they ran out of um, space basically to make a single core more powerful. So they started putting multiple cores on the uh, on one chip. Um, and so if you look at just one chip of like what we have, like for example, the, the CPU nodes on Perlmutter today, uh, it has a whole bunch of cores on it, and they all share memory together. And that is like a little SMP system, right? If you think about it, that little node, especially if you could somehow have a time machine and take that back 20 years ago, that would be like a supercomputer back then, kind of. Um, and then on the other hand, if you look at it from the macro scale, from, from you know the big picture, you have all of these nodes and each node is connected to a whole bunch of other nodes. And so from the macro scale, this is really a distributed memory architecture, right? This is a cluster architecture at the large scale. At the small scale, this is an SMP architecture. So why not take the programming paradigms that are best for both of those and apply them within that scope, right? So on a node, we can use OpenMP. And then between nodes, we can use MPI, right? Genius. So that's what we are calling a hybrid programming model. Okay, so the next question you're asking me is, is hybrid programming always better? No. 
No, it's not always better, especially if you programmed it poorly. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's my little sweat smile there. Yes. Uh, if you did if you did it wrong, then it'll actually make things a lot worse. And it also kind of depends on the architecture of the system that you're using, of course. So I like to think of it as kind of an accelerator model. So in the OpenMP parallel region, we're using the power of all of the multi-cores on our node, right? And then outside of that, we're using only one MPI process. So if we can exploit that kind of threaded parallelism a lot for a value of a lot that you feel comfortable with, then we should give it a shot. Okay, so here are some things to think about when you're designing your algorithm. So there's no right or wrong answers. These are just things you need to consider. So are communication and computation discrete phases of your algorithm or can they or do they overlap with each other? Pros and cons either way. And then um, inside of the, the, the uh, hybrid regions where you're, where you're doing the open MP, do you communicate there? Do you communicate only outside of those parallel regions? Um, do you think you could assign a manager thread that's responsible for inter-process communication? Or would you wanna let you know some, some subset of threads perform inter-process communication? Or would you wanna have all of them just kind of have a free-for-all and communicate with other processes? So you, you have to kind of think about these things that and how it would best be designed uh, with your algorithm and also with the limitations of your brain, right? Because designing something where all threads communicate with other processes, that can be really hard to get correct. So MPI has threading support. So there's four levels of support. Um, and so the first one is MPI thread single, where only one thread is allowed. Um, so if you're doing any MPI business, you have to not be in a in a a region where you're doing threading. Um, if if uh, the next level is MPI thread funnel, and you have a manager thread, and that's the only thread that is permitted to make MPI calls. And then you have MPI thread serialized, that's our next level, and that's where all threads can make MPI calls, but only one thread can do a call at a time. And then we have MPI thread multiple, and there's no restrictions. It's the wild west of threading support. Okay, and then uh, if you are using an MPI implementation that is only MPI one, uh, then by default, you're just gonna get MPI thread single, okay? Uh, but most MPI implementations are MPI two or above. All right. Um, so if you want to know what, what threading model does my machine support, I've got a code for you. So you could run this on Perlmutter, or you could just look at me already running it on Perlmutter, and you can find out. So basically, let me go back here to, to my code. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure it out. So it's... I'll show you this in a sec, but instead of just using MPI init, we use MPI init thread, and we ask it for MPI thread multiple, and then we see what it provides, okay? And then we print it out. So this is what I wanted, and then these are gonna be zero, one, two, three. And so this is what I get, level three of zero, one, two, three. Okay, um, so I kind of already explained this, but if you're gonna if you're gonna use threading within your hybrid code, then instead of MPI init, you want to do MPI init thread, and required is what you're asking for. Okay, what level you want, and supported is what you got. So typically, whatever you get is what you asked for. Uh, but if it's not available, then it's going to give you the lowest level 
bigger than what you asked for. And if that's not available, then it's going to get you the biggest number less than what you asked for. And if you use just plain old MPI init instead of MPI init thread, uh, then you're going to get MPI thread single. All right. And then at the end of your code, you want to make sure that MPI finalized is called by the same thread that called MPI init thread. So then there's some other useful MPI functions that you can use. So uh, is thread main is one MPI is thread main. This, your thread calls it to determine whether it is the main thread or not. And then um, query thread here, what that does is it, you call that to figure out what level of thread support you have. And you're like, why would I want to, why would I want to do that? Uh, well, the reason you would want to do that is you might have your algorithm um, written in different ways depending on what level of thread support is possible, right? So if you had, you know, one level of thread support, you might do things one way, and another level, you might do things a different way. Okay, so remember, if we are um, using the single, which is like a, like coming back here, single is the very lowest one. Only one thread is allowed whenever we're running uh, any kind of MPI command. Then we can use the um, the single pragma. Okay, um, and so typically what you want to do is you would have a barrier so that would stop all of the threads in their tracks. And then you would have this, where only one thread would be doing whatever MPI command that you want to do. You would have another barrier where everybody waits for this MPI command to finish, and then you would move on with your life. Okay? Now, if we're going up to funneled, so remember, funnel is, um, you know, the where you can have it there, but you can only have like one uh, sort of manager thread that does it. So you would use this master pragma. And so um, again, you would have a barrier, you would stop everybody in their tracks right there. Uh, you would have this master pragma and the boss thread gets to do the MPI thing. And then you would have a barrier to sync everybody back and then they would go about their business. Okay, now serialized, that's the one where all the threads can do something, but uh, only one at a time. So you would have this single pragma where only one at a time is able to do it. And then once everybody is done, then they'll move on. So you don't need a barrier at the end to synchronize. Okay, now multiple. Um, so, the Intel implementation supports multiple by default. The Cray one, I thought you had to turn it on with an environment variable, but I guess my previous uh, output says that that's not true. So <clears throat> you don't need any pragmas to protect your MPI calls. You can just put them wherever you want. Um, there are a few constraints here. The uh, ordering of the MPI calls uh, maintained within each thread but not across MPI process. So, so you're responsible for preventing any race conditions. Um, and blocking MPI calls block only the thread that's calling them. Um, honestly, multiple is very rarely required. And there's so many scary things here. I mean, I'm telling you about race conditions that you're responsible for finding. And, Ah, those are just a nightmare to find most of the time. So, so my advice for you is to not use multiple unless for some reason you absolutely need it because it's just kind of the wild west of threading, like I said. Anybody can do anything at any time and then you need to figure out what's going on. So kind of a nightmare, I would say. So which threading model should I use? Um, well, I would say you should use the simplest threading model that you can get away with based on your application. 
So there are pros and cons, of course, to each one. So the single method is supported by every MPI implementation portable guaranteed to work. But there's a lot of things that you can't do, right? Kind of a limited flexibility when you're using the single model. Um, so the next suggestion would be funnel, right? So funnel, it's pretty, you know, it's it's relatively straightforward to program it. Um, you run the risk, though, of your manager thread getting overloaded if you're doing a lot of MPI within your threaded regions. Um, serial, you have a lot more freedom to communicate. You start to run this risk of cross communication. And multiple is, you know, theoretically anyway, completely thread safe. I'm not sure how they can possibly test that to be sure that it is thread safe. Um, but typically, I guess it's it's available a lot of times, but like the performance of it tends to be suboptimal because there's so much checking that has to be done, you know, to keep everything thread safe. So my recommendation would be, first of all, you want to minimize the number of MPI calls that you're doing in a parallel region. And then if you have to do them, you probably want to keep it pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So probably somewhere in single funnel or serial would be what I would recommend. Even that could be a little risky. Okay. So did y'all's mom say stuff like, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do it too? Did, did your parents say that to you? Mind them. So I just want to remind you that just because you can communicate thread to thread doesn't necessarily mean that you should. So there's a big trade-off between lumping messages together and sending individual messages. So every time you send a message, there's an overhead, right? You have to create the message and then you have to send it and, and then uh, it has to be received. So there's, there's this overhead um, that is necessary every time you send a message, whether it's a big message or a small message. So if you send one big message, you just use that overhead one time, right? Versus if you send individual messages, maybe they'll get there faster individually, but you have a lot of overhead with each one of them. Um, another thing to think about is programmability, right? So like I said, sometimes we have a little limitation in our brains where we can't quite figure out how this algorithm is gonna work or what is wrong. Like we think it should work, but there's just something wrong. We have to find these really hard things to find like race conditions. Um, and so getting it working can be a huge challenge if you have a really complex hybrid algorithm. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a little example here. Um, this is just an overview, it, there's no code involved. So we talked about before, a lot of times people will have sort of like some kind of a region or like a like an area where they're trying to calculate, you know, the potential energy, something like that. And so typically they, what they do is they make a mesh of finite elements, if anybody's heard of finite elements. And so in this case, I'm going to have just a square mesh, very simple, uh, straightforward sort of a thing. Um, and we, we have these little boxes and we partition them between different MPI processes. And so every, when they're on different processes, we're gonna to need to communicate at those borders between them, right? To, to pass information about, you know, what is the potential energy in my region versus in your neighbor's region, okay? So we're gonna to have to communicate information about domain adjacent cells to computationally remote neighbors. So here's, here's just kind of a, a, a sketch of what I'm talking about here. So let's say we have four processes. So we've got the red, the blue, or sorry, red, yellow, blue, and brown processes on my picture here. Um, and so you can see like between the red and the yellow, there's a big uh, border there that where they kind of share values. And so we need to communicate across that border, right? Now, typically what you'll do is if, let's say you also have four threads, 
on each one. So then you're going to communicate, or I'm sorry, you're going to further subdivide into four little subregions in your in your mesh, in your rectangle there, right? Um, and so then each of those kind of has to communicate with their with their counterparts across those. Uh, those MPI process borders. So that, then that becomes the question then like, how do you best communicate? So if you think about it, you could just communicate like those big kind of fatter purple lines. Those represent like how many communications that you need to send in total from process zero to process one, for example. So you could do that, or you could send individual messages, right? from like process zero thread zero to process one thread zero and process one thread one, right? So you could do that if you were really clever about it. But again, it's kind of complicated and you probably wouldn't want to do it. Probably you'd just be better off sending one big message with all of the information. Okay, so the last thing that we were gonna do is compute pi with hybrid programming. So theoretically, we should have we should have figured out how to write the OMP version and the MPI version, and then we would just kind of squish them together and have a hybrid version. Okay. What I'll do is I'll program it standing here. Copy and paste everything. And yeah, and people can people can follow along and see how it goes. Nice. Do the survey. Oh yes, and don't forget to do the survey. Put the survey in the Zoom chat. Yes, please put it in the Zoom chat. Yeah, there's a lot of great resources about OpenMP. By the way, you may notice this amazing book right here that I put at the top. Oops, right there. Really, really great book. It won't even put you to sleep, unlike the MPI standard. Okay, and yeah, so we've got a lot of resources here for you if you're interested in looking at other resources.